Hello everybody, welcome to our introductory lecture for natural resources where we'll be discussing uh, some natural resources um, fundamental ideas and also natural resources history. So let's kind of start with the beginning and kind of just go over really the basics. So um, first easy question or simple question uh, to answer is what are natural resources and our simple definition for that is going to be anything that comes from the earth that we use so examples could be um, water air land, um, land and soil minerals living organisms plants uh, wildlife any of these things that we uh, use in society anything that we um, that we take from the earth but also use we're going to consider natural resources. And there's going to be uh, many different categories of those, and we'll go over those um, late in a later lecture. So why should we learn about natural resources, and why should we uh, care? Well, in primitive society, individuals need to have complete understanding of their surroundings to survive. And that kind of same understanding is still necessary today because we need to understand how to efficiently use our natural resources and how to get the most that we can out of the resources that we have. And the, the simple, simplest explanation for that is we have one Earth. We have one planet. And if we have everything that we need to survive on this planet... There's no reason that we shouldn't be able to figure out how to use it best. Now, the one problem that we have is that we keep adding one specific species. We keep adding people, and we keep running into um, issues of sustainability. Now, with um, all, all my lectures, you'll see as it's highlighted here, I've got a YouTube video. So um, what I like to suggest is that you um, also have the uh, PDF copy of the slides open, and you can pause this video right now and then um, look at the PDF slides and be able to click on the videos and then watch those videos and then come back uh, to this narrated lecture. So click on that video for sustainability. But the big thing uh, right now is the idea that there's almost 8 um, billion people on the earth. And to try and put that in context for you, is just the idea of um, thinking about how long it would take you to count to a billion. So if you were to just start going one, two, three, four, five, six, it would take you years just to count to a billion. And that's, that's in fact, it would take you roughly almost 32 years if you were to just try and count to a billion starting right now without sleeping without eating without taking a break and that's that's being generous to say that it would only take you one second to to be able to to count each number so it's a really huge number and it's one species and it's a large species too because we have billions of insects on this planet and different species of insects and we have billions and billions of them but they're so small and they take up such a such a small portion of this planet human beings are such a large species that take up a large part of this planet and we're doing and we're spread out all over the planet and we're doing all these different things so it's it's very um it's a very complex problem to try and maintain society the way that we feel um like is at that it's adequate for our needs but then also realizing that the planet has a way that it functions correctly and for us to be able to understand that we need to fit into um, that way that the planet functions correctly and for us to really understand that that we are just one species on this planet and we need to just try and do our best to um, to help this planet and help the ecosystems within the planet stay healthy. So one of the ways we're going to try and do that is just through the term sustainability. 
and you're going to see um, certain things pop up multiple times. One of those things is uh, quotations from Aldo Leopold, who is uh, a naturalist and a, a great figure in the natural resources community. So I've, I've got this quote, this quotation here that says, A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And what is he really saying there? He's saying using natural resources in a way that ensures their availability to future generations. We want to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the living environment. We want to make sure that that is fine in perpetuity for generations upon generations upon generations. And that's what we're talking about when we're discussing the idea of sustainability. But just as I had mentioned before, the idea of um, the problem with the population is as our population increases, our use of resources are going to increase. And as our use of resources increases, that means our environmental impact also increases. So our challenges are to live more efficiently. So we want to find better ways to use what we have. And then we want to make sure that we can use our existing natural resources to support our population because ultimately it's it's going to become a problem if we as society just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and we really just have to put in the effort and put in the work to make sure that it's not problematic so is it possible though because we've got We've got some big issues. So what are what are what's our biggest issue? It's just population growth and this increased demand for natural resources. So how do we solve it? So re resource natural resource efficiency, taking what we have and using it in the best ways possible and using the least amount of it while getting the maximum use from it. And then also um an understanding of the resources that we have. So we have on this planet renewable resources and non-renewable resources. And we want to use as many renewable resources as we can because we can manage those or with proper management, those resources can be used in perpetuity. The non-renewable resources, even with proper management, cannot be used in perpetuity. So that's that's going to be an important idea that we're going to discuss later on. It does get really complicated because um, depending on the different studies you look at, there's going to be some sort of a peak in our population. This model here suggests that um, it might happen in 2030. Some models predict um, somewhere around 2050. But the idea that the population gets so big and the planet is not going to get any bigger. The planet is as big as it is. The resources are the resources that we have that stuff's not going to change but we're going to need more food we're going to need um, more um, more uh, lumber for houses we're going to need more water and we're going to have bigger problems with pollution and all of these ideas really get to the idea that um, there should be some sort of inflection point there should be some sort of a peak and then um, a downward trend because there's just only so much planet that um, that we have and the population can keep growing and growing and growing but eventually there's got to be a point um, to where uh, things start becoming problematic so with the that idea we really want to get into the ideas of conservation because conservation is at the core of sustainability conservation just at its simplest definition is just the prevention of a wasteful use of a resource and going back like i said um, another uh, aldo leopold quote uh, it's a state of harmony between man and the land and this goes to uh, he's speaking about uh, a land ethic it's a um, it's a uh, doctrine that he had where he really believed in the idea of harmony 
between man and land and that um, the land will provide everything that we need if we take care of the land. And it's and it's a really powerful idea in terms of conservation and sustainability. Another way that we really can get to the heart of how are we going to um, deal with natural resources, how are we going to be able to do uh, these bigger ideas of sustainability and conservation is through the study of ecology. So ecology at its simplest, the study of the place we live or um, slightly more um, more wordy the study of organisms at home or the relation of organisms to their environment and so um, going just into the history of the word ecology um, it comes from the greek word oikos yeah that's the same word that you see on those yogurts in the store and that word means home and so really just ecology is the study of home or how things relate to each other in their home and so we take that to be the relation of or relation or relationships between organisms and their environment or the relationships of the organisms to each other within their environment how do they how do all these things interact in the place that they live and when you really think about that it what we're studying in ecology is the structure and the function of nature how is nature structured how does it work how does how do all these things shown here on this graphic biodiversity species interaction succession human impacts energy flow how do all of these things come together and how do how do they work and so when we when we um, discuss ecology and we're going to discuss it in depth uh, in future lectures how do we get how do we get all these things to work and fit in and come together and then how do we keep that balance it's going to be extremely important for our understanding of natural resources and especially important in when we decide that we're going to start thinking about uh, management principles and how are we going to manage an area it's going to become really important to to understand the idea of how nature how nature is structured and how it functions in order for us to say well this is how we're going to manage it to make sure that we can keep um, these ecosystems uh, in check and uh, working properly and functioning uh, for a long time. So now I put this slide up because I think it's really important to understand that I'm going to try and summarize a lot of history, um, specifically within the United States in terms of natural resources, but there's a lot more to it than um, what I'm going to talk about, but I'm just going to try and hit on um, some points because if we tried to talk about natural resources history just by itself, that's a whole 16 week course. So just a brief history of the resource conservation, environmental and sustainability movements in this country. So let's start off with exploitation because that's that's where we started. So um, for a lot of this um, lot of history, uh, if we take it back to prior to European settlement, um, it was native. Native Americans throughout uh, the United States. And most of those populations, um, depending on where they were, some of them were hunter-gatherers, um, some of them were more settled, uh, some of them uh, were more nomadic in their movements. They had to live off the land. So they um, much more mimicked what uh, Aldo Leopold is talking about in his uh, land ethic where you had to live off the land, so you have to trust the land and you have to take care of the land because um, without the land, you can't function. And so um, the, the Native Americans had that approach. In fact, so much that they, they their understanding of the land um, led to them being able to manage the land, being able to use things like fire to clear out areas either for, um, for living space uh, for hunting trails, for um, to get different crops uh, to come up in terms of uh, if they were looking for berries or um, 
some sort of other species where if they used fire they can they can bring um, more of those more fruit to bear and so uh, a lot once the European settlers came here and they um, they noticed this beautiful land they thought and this is where kind of the idea of exploitation starts to begin is they they thought look at this land look at how beautiful it is look at how bountiful it is look at all these natural resources this place is perfect it's it's set up and it's and it's perfect but a lot of that was actually managed it wasn't just nature in some of those areas that they saw some of the areas it was and it was just nature taking its course but some of these areas were actually managed um, by native american populations and so we um we as a culture of uh of people in this country uh started off with the idea of look how beautiful this is look at all these resources that we have um you know this is perfect and maybe didn't understand the effort that it took um to actually get it to be that way and so then now uh, once we get european settlements displacing uh, the Native Americans, we lose uh, this management perspective. So we get a lot of areas um, that become, um, that go from forest um, to uh, to agriculture because we're now um, talking about colonial times and we're talking about settlement. So people aren't moving around as much. Um, there were, there was a lot of nomadic movement um, to some of the Native American tribes um, and but their populations weren't um, weren't problematic for the areas but now all of a sudden once we get European settlement and people start hearing about all the um, natural resources or the riches of this land and all this land that's available and all this opportunity now all of a sudden people want to come to the United States, people want to be a part of that. People want to settle and get their piece of land, and and now all of a sudden there's this big use of natural resources. Um, so much so that uh, if we're talking about forestry within the United States, um, pretty much unless it's an area that was inaccess inaccessible, every um, forest in this on uh, in this country has been cut down at one point or another now they've grown back so they're so we call those second growth forests or if they've been cut down a few times third growth fourth growth but the idea that these forests um haven't been here for um hundreds of years they they've all been used at some point in time and it was for all sorts of things it was for um it was for uh housing materials it's for fencing materials. It's for uh, the railroad. Once uh, westward expansion um, starts, it's uh, the majority of wood that was cut down was used uh, just for the idea of fuel and for warmth, which is still the number one use of wood uh, today in the world. Is just the idea of of burning it for warmth, and so you get a lot of uh, land clearing because we want to bring people in and we want to have these areas and people want this experience and to be able to use these natural resources and it's just a lack of understanding that um, the land will heal itself when the land is just dealing with itself but once you bring in a species and human beings um, and the Europeans uh, specifically at this time are almost almost like an invasive species where they're coming in to an area that they aren't native to and then they're just doing um, whatever they want so it's almost the same as as an invasive species just coming and taking over and so when that happens usually you have some problems to the native ecosystem because it's not adapted to that species it doesn't uh, understand how to deal with that species and that those sort of adaptations take um, years or hundreds of years or decades or eons for the ecosystem to figure out and so that's that's where we start getting this exploitation idea we start also having problems with soil erosion because we need um, 
these lands were used to having trees on them and now all of a sudden they're cleared off and a lot of um a lot of areas are also are suffering from the idea of just um cut and leave so take all the take all we can from this area oh well I guess we're done. We're out of the natural resources. Well, let's just move on to the next area. Uh, we also started to see issues with exploitation in terms of wildlife as well. So um, from the 1700s to the 1900s, we see the period of greatest abuse of wildlife, um, big uh, declines in deer populations because of, of hunting. Um, Right here, I've got this uh, statistic. Uh, in 1748, South Carolina traders shipped 160,000 deer skins. Now, with our population now uh, in the U.S. at 330 million people, 160,000 deer, um, maybe not a big deal. But at the time, the estimated population of South Carolina was less than 6,000 people. And so if every single person in South Carolina was hunting, that's still quite a lot of deer um, per person. And you, and you have to figure out, you have to think about even back then, probably the whole population was not out hunting deer. So it's a lot of deer per person in terms of the population. And so um, a lot of the problems with, um, with the abuse of wildlife can't be, were because there were no regulations in place. So there's no season or... Um, or needing to get a um, a pass or any limits or any of those sorts of things. So by the time we get the founding of America, all states um, had started to to realize this and started to put some regulations in place, except for uh, Georgia. But you know, there's always exceptions to every rule. Um, we also start uh, during the same period seeing problems with extirpation. And so extirpation is the idea of a localized extinction or um, having a population that was in a much wider area now being forced and only living in a certain area. And this happened with um, bison and elk are kind of the, the two most obvious, where they had populations all the way into the eastern United States and, and throughout, um, throughout the United States. But because of this overhunting, because of this moving westward, all of a sudden, um, by the mid 1800s, bison and elk were both extirpated um, from the eastern United States and no longer had populations there. And just in case you're wondering, yes, this is a bison. It is not a buffalo. A buffalo is actually a species from Africa. Um, even though you will hear people say buffalo all the time, this is actually a bison. Oh, we get westward expansion. Now, this isn't history class, so I'm not going to go deep into explaining this map because I'm more interested in a map like this for natural resources class. Now, um, in light, in light, um, light brown or tan, you can see the original range of the buffalo, or sorry, the bison. Now I got myself confused talking about the two terms. So bison in this country, it's a nomadic species. It roams around um, depending on the seasons and um, food availability. So these animals, these big, huge herds of millions of bison used to roam all the way from northern Mexico to uh, Nevada and eastern Oregon to the plain, the high plains uh, in these areas, all the way up to the northern territories in Canada, all the way to the Great Lakes, and all the way to New York, Pennsylvania, and all along the east coast. But by 1870, you can see that now we're only into the Great Plains areas and two specific areas of the Great Plains. And then by 1889, we're just in these little green areas these little um, pockets and so we've we, we've not only reduced the area the habitat and the range um, the home range for this animal but we've also decimated the population of this animal and um, you'll see a um, with elk you'll probably see something similar not as big of a range but 
a similar kind of uh, loss of, of habitat with the elk during the same period of time. And so then um, another good example from this period is the passenger pigeon. So the passenger pigeon uh, had an po estimated population of around three and a half billion uh, animals of this species in the 1700s. And by 1914, this animal was extinct. And this was due to hunting and habitat loss. Uh, part of it is that passenger pigeons were very easy to hunt. And, but the other part of it is just the idea of um, of people spreading out into this country and um, and being able to um, find something so easy to hunt and eat and um, basically forcing its extinction. So uh, here's a link um, to a YouTube video of uh, about the history of the passenger pigeon and specifically Martha who was the uh, the last passenger pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo. But you can see by this drawing here why um, the passenger pigeon uh, went uh, extinct because it's very a very easy animal to hunt and that sort of thing um, makes it made made it um, to where it's easily understandable how it went extinct. Now, one thing that's um, that I always like to remind people about and get them to understand is we've got to think about the time as well um, and what was happening at the time. So it's easy for us to look back and say, oh, man, I can't believe they hunted this animal into extinction. It's another thing to say, well, why? What was happening? What did they think about? And you have to remember at this time, people aren't living as long as they do right now. The average lifespan of a person wasn't um, up in the 70s um, in terms of how many years they were around. Also, there weren't a lot, there weren't a bunch of grocery stores where you can just go get all your meat. Um, you had to go and hunt sometimes to get your meals. And so it's a lot, it's a lot different way of living. There's a lot more um, back then about the idea of just survival. And we uh, we nowadays have kind of lost what that feels like in terms of um, having to really worry about survival. And so it's it's harder for us to um, to understand their their way of life. But um, you don't. It's not. It's really just. Um, ignorance on their part and not ignorance in a bad way but just ignorance in the idea of not knowing the idea of thinking that these resources are unlimited looking at you know a giant flock of birds like that and going well there's millions of them it's not like we can shoot every single one of them but yeah it can happen but that's just it's ignorance and it's it's not it's not on they weren't taught natural resources. You guys are. And so I'm hoping that you learn some of these lessons and we're able to um, definitely avoid some of these problems in the future. But it's something to really consider is that um, they're just there's a lack of knowledge at this point in time, which makes it really hard uh, for for people to to understand natural resources. So stuff that's on the east coast right the people people who moved out west they understood it they got it better no here's a map of california this is a map of um california grizzly species now are there any grizzly bears in california anymore nope they've been extirpated from california and uh that's due to the idea of hunting and um people moving out west and loss of habitat and all the same reasons the elk and the bison moved away from the east. So um, just because uh, that sort of thing happened on the east coast doesn't mean that when people moved out west uh, that it somehow changed or that we were somehow better at it. It's just a lack of knowledge of how natural resources worked at this point in time. 
and in fact, to try and put some numbers on it, since 1900, 69 mammal species have gone extinct, and so have 400 other vertebrates. And this is actually typical if you kind of still go back to thinking of um, human beings as an invasive species. Um, it's, it's a typical thing that happens when an invasive species comes to an area. It comes and dominates that area and basically gives other species the ultimatum um, of, uh, you know, figure it out or die off. And we're going to go into that idea. Um, we're going to delve into that deeper in, in further lectures. But the idea that, that human beings kind of have taken over and just said, we're here, deal with it. It's, uh, it's been, uh, a little bit difficult, uh, for some species and it's been deadly for others. A good example of, um, just how destructive something can be, uh, is to look at, uh, Yellowstone National Park. So in the 1920s, we had a government policy that allowed the extermination of the gray wolf throughout the park. Um, we didn't understand uh, how an ecosystem works, and we're going to talk about how that, how that happens. But we didn't understand that if you took out the gray wolf, which is the apex predator for this uh, ecosystem, that there would be ripple effects all the way through the, um, through the ecosystem. That's called um, what happened in Yellowstone is called the Trophic Cascade. And basically what that was is all the gray wolves got hunted out of Yellowstone and got extirpated out of Yellowstone. But then what happened was the elk and the deer populations went out of control. They started eating up all the willow trees and all the aspen trees. So all the willows, the willow trees disappeared and the aspen trees disappeared. And then since the willow trees and the aspen trees weren't there, then the beaver population disappeared, and once the beaver population disappeared, the beaver also being another keystone species like the gray wolf, then when the beavers disappeared, then all of a sudden there weren't any dams being made, and then these freshwater areas that, that other animals depended on disappeared, and all of a sudden you start having all these problems down the food chain to where you had your trophic structure, which is your food chain, falls apart, during this trophic cascade. And a lot of people actually say that it wasn't until the um, great Yellowstone fires of 1988 that everything got rebalanced uh, within Yellowstone. And then also the idea of in the 2000s where they finally decided to bring um, wolves back into Yellowstone to balance out the population. So oh, since 1930, we've lost 52% of the Earth's bird, mammal, fish, reptile, and amphibian populations. So it's, you know, it's one thing to say way back when they didn't understand um, what was going on and um, how to fix the problem, but um, we're still running into these problems because we still haven't figured out the way, the best way to, to um, deal with our natural resources. I think we're really on the right track now but it's taken a while and um, it's been a long period of exploitation uh, we do still have uh, a, a lot of endangered animals in north america so here's a list uh, if you wanted to see some other species um, besides the ones on this uh, picture in terms of an endangered species uh, that we have here in the united states and if you think about, well, that's happening in all these other areas, but it's not happening here. This right here is a picture of a San Joaquin kit fox. So the San Joaquin kit fox is an endangered species. And even here at Bakersfield College, we've had some issues with um, endangered species and with uh, the kit fox being on campus and then kit foxes being removed or their burrows being, um, being uh, destroyed. And so uh, we really have to look at, at our policies and how we deal with the environment and how we deal with natural resources and whether or not uh, intrinsically these uh, animals, these natural resources, all these different things 
um, that the planet gives us, are they important to us? Do we care enough? Do we understand how taking care of these animals, taking care of their habitats will benefit us as well as another species within that ecosystem?